coronavirus briefing. I'm joined by Dr. Jenny Harris, the Chief Executive of UXA, the UK Health Security Agency. Every day we are unwavering in our focus to protect life and keep our nation safe from this deadly virus. And today I'd like to bring you up to speed on some new developments in our response and start with the latest data. The latest data show that the number of cases of coronavirus are rising. Yesterday, we saw 3,542 new cases, the highest since the 12th of April. The variant first identified in India, so-called B1617.2, is still spreading. And the latest estimates are that more than half and potentially as many as three quarters of all new cases are now of this variant. Now, as we set out our roadmap, we always expected cases to rise. We must remain vigilant. The aim, of course, is to break the link to hospitalizations and deaths so that cases alone no longer require stringent restrictions on people's lives. The critical thing to watch is the link from the number of cases to how many people end up in hospital. The increase in cases remains focused in hotspots, and we're doing all we can to tackle this variant wherever it flares up. Over the past six months, we now have built a huge testing capacity at our disposal, and we're using this to surge testing into the eight hotspot areas and in other places where cases are lower but rising. In the hotspot areas, we're sur surging vaccines too uh, for those who are eligible. In Bolton, for instance, we've done 17,147 vaccinations in the last week. All of the available evidence shows that the best way to protect yourself, your loved ones, and your community against this new variant is to get both jabs. Of the 49 people who are in hospital with COVID in Bolton, only five have had both vaccine doses. And earlier today, I spoke to Fiona Noden, the chief executive of Bolton Hospital, and her message is very clear. The hospital is functioning well and is open to all those who need it, but people need to be careful and cautious and follow the rules and take personal responsibility to help to slow the spread. She also said that, and I quote, I dread to think where we'd be without the vaccine. So please ask people to come forward and get the jab. So when you get the call, get the jab. And make sure you come forward for your second dose so you can get the maximum possible protection. The vaccine is severing the link between cases and hospitalizations and deaths from coronavirus. This week's ONS data show that three in four adults now have COVID-19 antibodies, including over 90% of people aged 50 and above. And this means that the vast majority of those most vulnerable to this virus have that protection that antibodies provide. But I want to see those rates climb further. Having three in four adults with antibodies is important, but there's more still to do. And today's data from Public Health England show why this is important. They have estimated that over the last week, the vaccination programme has prevented a further 200 deaths and prevented a further 600 people from going into hospital. Bringing these figures together, it means that in total, 13,200 deaths have been prevented and 39,700 hospitalizations by the vaccination program. So the case for getting the jab has never been stronger and we're putting jabs into arms as quickly as humanly possible. We've given, in fact, 4.1 million vaccines over the past week, which is the highest figure since March. And I'm absolutely delighted to see how this is rolling out in different parts of the country. Thanks to the incredible hard work of colleagues across the Midlands, including Andy Street, the mayor of the West Midlands, and NHS colleagues right across the Midlands, and so many others, 
we have today hit the milestone of 10 million vaccines being delivered across the Midlands. In the southwest of England, where I was earlier this week, visiting vaccination centres as far flung as the Isles of Scilly, over 5 million doses have been delivered. Three quarters of adults in the southwest have now had their first dose, and over half have had both doses. This is the highest proportion in the country. All in all, this rapid progress in the rollout of vaccines, in this race between the virus and the vaccines, this rapid rollout means that yesterday we were able to open up vaccinations to all those aged 30 and above, and I would urge everybody to come forward. Next week, I'll be hosting G7 health ministers at the Health Ministers Summit in Oxford. Oxford has been at the cutting edge of science during this pandemic. They led the recovery trial that uncovered treatments that have saved millions of lives across the world. And of course, they developed the Oxford vaccine, which is Britain's gift to the world. That has now been deployed without any profit margin to 450 million doses across the world. Today, I can update you that half a million people here have now signed up to our vaccine registry, uh, research registry. The vaccine research registry is about having a group of people who are prepared to take part in clinical trials. And they've signed up to say that they're ready and willing to take part. And this is important because our world leading position in the discovery of new medicines relies on these clinical trials. And I'm incredibly grateful to the half a million people who are all playing their part. Today, I can announce further that together with CEPI, the global vaccination effort, we have funded the expansion of another important Oxford study, which is the first in the world to look at whether different vaccines can safely be used as part of a two dose regime using different vaccines, and if they can be mixed, then, uh, and they can be mixed without reducing effectiveness, or indeed mixed and lead to an increase in effectiveness, then this could have a huge impact on speeding up vaccination campaigns all the way across the world, and getting more people the protection that's needed from this deadly virus. It has the potential to transform lives globally, and it is brilliant frankly, to see that once again, research which is taking place on our shores and at our universities is leading the way. One of the most promising areas of new research is into antivirals. The thing about antivirals is that you can give them to people in an area of an, of an outbreak, for instance, to reduce their chance of catching COVID if they come into contact with somebody who has got COVID. So, for instance, you can use antivirals to help suppress an outbreak these antivirals are not yet approved, and the Prime Minister has set a goal of having two available later this year. Antivirals can treat people early, preventing mild disease from turning into something much more serious, and they can use as a prophylactic, preventing the virus from spreading. I'm absolutely determined that our antivirals task force will channel the same positive, can-do, collaborative spirit that worked so successfully for vaccines. And I'm pleased to be able to announce that Eddie Gray has been appointed as chair. Eddie brings a wealth of experience from his time at GSK uh, and at Dynavax. And I know that Eddie will make a huge contribution at this time of national need. Our response to this pandemic is a big team effort. And Eddie's leadership will help make that team stronger still. It's this team, this collective endeavour, which you've been a part of, that's got us this far. But the pandemic is not yet over. So please, keep doing your bit. Remember the basics, hands, face, space and fresh air. Get your rapid, regular tests. And when you get the call, get both jabs. I'll now hand over to Dr Harries to talk through the latest data in a bit more detail. Thank you, Secretary of State. Um, could I have the first slide, please? Uh, so what we can see on this side, uh, which we've seen before, is the number of people, whether this be bilateral flow test or, or PCR test, po testing positive for COVID-19 in the UK. Um, and of course, we can see that there has been a sustained and sharp decline in cases from a peak of over 60,000 in the middle of January uh, on towards, towards May. 
Um, if I could have the next slide, please. Uh, but if we just look at the end of that tail end of the chart, what you can see here is, is a suggestion of an upward rise in cases, which the Secretary of State has referred to. So these are seven-day uh, rolling averages, um, and the numbers here are up to 2,773 cases on that rolling average, but you can see the latest data at 3,500. Uh, now, the interpretation of this needs careful consideration because, uh, as we've described, there is surge testing going out into those areas which actually have the highest number of cases. And so we are actively finding many cases, which is a good thing. We can break the chains of transmission. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we do know that in most cases across the UK now, uh, the new variant is taking, uh, the variant which originated in India is taking uh, place of the 117 variant. Uh, so something that we need to watch really carefully. Uh, but if we go to the next slide, uh, then we can look at how that translates into people uh, turning up in hospital and being admitted with serious illness. Uh, and what we can see here is that, the, again, the hospital uh, bed occupation for patients with COVID-19 has dropped right down very rapidly, uh, following to a large extent uh, um, the end of the uh, uh, lockdown measures, significant lockdown measures, but significant lockdown measures, but also, of course, at the same time that the vaccination programme has really been pushed out strongly. So on the 25th of May, we can see that there were 915 people in hospital with, with COVID, whereas if we go right back to middle of January at the peak, uh, there were around 4,500 admissions every day. And we're just going to look on the next slide at the tail end of that curve. And in contrast, uh, currently, to the data that we saw on uh, actual numbers of cases, we can see that the uh, patients admitted to hospital has continued to decline or flatten off, but we are not seeing a sharp increase in cases in hospital admissions. And then if we go on to the next slide, uh, sadly, we can see that curve for the number of people who have uh, died within 28 days of a positive COVID case. And again, back in January at the peak, that was sadly over 1,000 a day. Uh, and when you look at the tail end of this graph as well, you can see that the most recent seven-day average uh, is, is just eight deaths, all of them very sad, but a significant decrease. Um, and these are predominantly in uh, older people who uh, have, um, uh, have not been vaccinated. Um, if you go on to the next slide, please. We can see that sticking along. You can see that, uh, as usual, we have a, a variation in reporting of the deaths. Often they will be low at the weekend and rise in the week. So it's important to look at the recent uh, average rolling rate, but that is now, seven-day average is now eight deaths per day. And then I think on the final slide, if we then just look at our vaccination rates, uh, what we can see here is the blue line, those who've had uh, first dose only, and then catching up very rapidly are those who've had a second dose. Uh, this is now over 60 million uh, individuals. Um, and uh, as the Secretary of State has said, the latest evidence suggests that, particularly in relation to the variant uh, first uh, identified from India, that it is that second dose which is really important. So we're looking to make sure that that uh, orange yellow bar keeps continuing upwards. So everybody go and get your jabs. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Harris. The uh, first questions will turn to our questions from the public. And the first one is from uh, Janet from Liverpool by video. Hi, given the EU are going to relax the rules for fully vaccinated visitors by allowing us in with a vaccine passport and with no PCR or lateral flow test requirements, when can we expect the UK to do the same for returning UK citizens? Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Janet, an important question. Uh, and we've set out the principles of, of having international travel uh, conducted in a safe way through the red, amber and green list. So, of course, right now you can travel to a green list country um, and whether or not you've been vaccinated, in fact. Um, and there's, of course, a testing regime because we are uh, vigilant at the border and want to make sure that we don't see a big increase in the number of cases coming from any of the green list countries. But at the moment, they're very low in the green list countries as they are here. Um, and then, obviously, we have more stringent rules for the amber and red list countries where people shouldn't be travelling for holiday. So that's the approach that we're taking. 
Uh, I've seen the proposals that the EU have put forward in terms of vaccinations. At the moment, not everybody has been vaccinated, of course, and uh, not all adults have been offered the jab, um, only those, everybody aged 30 and over. Um, but we do want to make sure that there is a route to safe international travel in the future. That's what the Global Travel Task Force has been, has been working on, something I work with the Transport Secretary, the Home Secretary and the Prime Minister on. Uh, but at the moment, it is the uh, red, amber and green approach uh, that guides us. And I think that's the right approach uh, because it means that when a country is safe, a very, very low number of cases, uh, no signs of significant new variants, uh, then we can have uh, relatively straightforward travel, albeit with those tests, which are incredibly important. But for countries which are more at risk, uh, we can take a more stringent approach. The next question's uh, from Pete from Derby, also by video. With each new variant, the effectiveness of existing vaccines becomes less and less. So, with the Indian variant spreading and now a new variant of concern in Yorkshire, why is the government allowing lockdown relaxation to continue when most of those who spread the virus have not yet even had one vaccination? Uh, thanks, Pete. It's an important question. I'm going to ask Dr. Harris to, uh, to set out the clinical view from the health security point of view. But what I'd say, first and foremost, is obviously we are working as fast as we can to get people to have both jabs. It's very important, and thankfully the uptake uh, is very high. But the second thing is that we monitor these new variants really, really carefully to check the effectiveness of the vaccines against them. Now, thankfully, the effectiveness of the uh, vaccines against the uh, variant first identified in India that you mentioned after two jabs does appear to be effectively the same as against the old B117 or the Kent uh, variant, as it was called. Um, and uh, that means that we can have confidence in the strategy that we have uh, and the strategy that is, has been working. But we've, of course, got to be vigilant to, these, to the number of cases and critically how the number of tra cases translates into people ending up in hospital or sadly dying. Uh, and so, you know, the approach we take is just to be uh, absolutely transparent about all of this data, set it all out, as Dr. Harris just has done, uh, the latest data, um, and answer as many questions as we can about it, as uh, fully as we can. Um, and uh, I'm sure Dr. Harris is going to improve on my answer right now. Thank you, um, Secretary of State. So, the vaccine effectiveness uh, prior to the uh, variant, the 617.2, uh, becoming the predominant one was around uh, 80 to 90 percent for both vaccines uh, once you'd had second doses and about 50 percent for the first um, and, and the good news from the report which Public Health England uh, published at the weekend was that actually we're seeing very very strong vaccine effectiveness after the second dose uh, for uh, both the vaccines now it's uh, it's around 80 to 90 percent for the Pfizer uh, it's a little bit lower perhaps than against the Kent variant um, and at the moment the data suggests that the the AstraZeneca one might be a little bit lower than, again, against the Kent variant, around 60%. But um, it's really important that those studies, they're quite early ones with quite wide confidence levels, so high, high degrees of uncertainty. And as we go forward with more cases and more numbers, they will become clearer. And we're already starting to see a signal that the AstraZeneca effectiveness is rising in the second dose. So there is a really important message here, which says actually these are good. Um, but as, the, uh, as, as Peter's pointed out, we do have to be really, really vigilant and going back to the first uh, answer around travel, it's why actually the testing for uh, travellers coming to the country is so important and the genomic work that we now do, uh, because we are not only assessing the risk uh, to UK residents and continuously searching for new variants, uh, but we're actually helping the rest of the world understand where those variants are at the moment. Thank you very much, Dr. Harris. Next question is from Laura Koonsberg at the BBC. Thank you, Secretary of State. It was common knowledge last year that there were terrible problems in care homes. Can you still stand there today and say it's true that you protected care homes from the start? And did you or did you not tell Downing Street that people leaving care homes would be tested 
before they, sorry, people leaving hospitals would be tested before they went back to care homes. Uh, thanks very much, Laura. We worked as, as hard as we could to protect people in, who live in care homes. And of course, those who live in care homes are some of the most vulnerable to this disease because by its nature, it attacks uh, and has more of an impact on older people. Now, when it comes to the testing of people as they left hospital and went into care homes, we committed to building the testing capacity to allow that to happen. Of course, it then takes time to build testing capacity. And in fact, one of the critical things we did was set the 100,000 target back then to make sure we built that testing capacity, and it was very effective uh, in doing so. And then we were able to introduce the policy of testing everybody before going to care homes. Uh, but we could only do that once we had the testing capacity, uh, which I had to build, because we didn't have it in this country from the start. You know, we started with a capacity of less than 2,000 in March last year and, and got to 100,000 tests a day. Um, and um, we set all of this out at the time in, uh, in public documents. It's all a matter of uh, a, a public record. Um, and, I mean, we worked closely together on it, uh, Jenny. Um, I think um, I might just add to that. From a professional perspective, I think uh, the testing is clearly important. And as Secretary of State has, has noted, uh, we have built a lot of capacity. This, uh, this is all uh, readily available now. We, we do uh, around a million tests a day. Uh, but I think, actually, one of the things that sometimes gets forgotten in some of the conversations about testing is the really important thing is not testing says you have a problem. The intervention is very much about uh, isolation. So when an individual uh, leaves, whether it be a, a hospital setting, uh, the guidance is very much about ensuring that there is appropriate infection prevention control both in the um, care home setting, but actually in separating that individual from others, because the test only gives you the result on the day. The really important thing is to be able to be sure that a patient doesn't become symptomatic and be able to transmit infection for the subsequent incubation period. So from an interventional perspective, that is critical. Testing is really helpful. Um, and I think the, the only other thing I would say is it's... Um, uh, you know, the, the elderly uh, who uh, and the vulnerable in residential settings have been a focus, actually, of a, a care subgroup uh, in the SAGE uh, um, um, modelling um, group. And, and actually, I chaired that group specifically to try and understand precisely where the risks were uh, predominantly in residents going into care homes and because of the very high infection rates. And there were two pieces of work commissioned uh, around that. And although the data is quite complex to interpret, it was very clear at the end of this work that the, there are different ways for uh, the virus to come into care homes. And it can come from a hospital discharge, but that is definitely not the majority route of entry. It's coming as community cases rise um, and care workers are going in and out as they do because we need them to provide care. Um, it's coming in with community uh, rates and we see that with schools as well. So I think it's just about really looking at the evidence of where transmission occurs, which is important. Thanks very much, Laura. Next question is from Carl Deneen from ITV. Hi. Uh, Secretary of State, uh, you've explained why you didn't test everyone going from hospital to care home, but the charge from Dominic Cummings is actually quite specific, and I'd like to try again on that. Did you tell the Prime Minister that everyone going from hospital to care home would be tested, or is Dominic Cummings not telling the truth on that? Of course we committed, and I committed, to getting the policy in place, but it took time to build the testing. You know, we didn't start with a big testing system in the UK, and then we built that testing system, and that's why the 100,000 target was so important, because it really accelerated the, the availability of testing. Because when you don't have much testing, we, we, had to we had to prioritize it according to clinical need. And so that was the approach that we took. In fact, we set all of this out at the time. But you know, it is important in terms of looking back on it that what we had to do was build the testing capacity because there simply wasn't at the start of the, the pandemic that testing capacity in place. We had to put it in place. Uh, and that's the action that I took. 
Thanks very much. The next question is from Beth Rigby at Sky. Thank you, Secretary of State. Just to follow up on that, uh, and specifically, Mr Cummings said yesterday that you categorically said in the Cabinet room in March that people were going to be tested before going back into care homes. Mr Cummings went on to say that he and the Prime Minister subsequently found out that hadn't happened. He said, far from putting a shield around people, they were sent back to care homes untested. So just to be clear, did you make the statement in March that they would be tested before going back to care homes? And that didn't turn out to be true because you didn't have the testing system in place. Is that what really happened? No, uh, look, there'll, there'll be a time when we go back over all this in great detail. But my recollection of events is that I committed to delivering that uh, testing for people going from hospital into care homes when we could do it. I then went away and built the testing capacity for all sorts of reasons and all sorts of uses, including this one, and then delivered on the commitment that I made. And that is a, that, that's kind of normal way of how you get things done in government. You work out what needs to happen, you commit to making it happen, you go away and deliver on that commitment, uh, and then you can put the policy in place. And um, you know, there'll be a time when we can go through all of this in greater detail. The most important thing right now is that we've still got a pandemic uh, to handle and to manage, uh, and hence the announcements that we're making today on vaccination and the work that we're doing to try to make sure we keep this epidemic under control. Um, next question is Pippa Creer from The Mirror. People back. Am I still sending people back to care homes untested did happen during April? And is that your biggest regret in this pandemic? Well, the thing is, Beth, on that, I mean, I've answered this question many, many times um, on that. Because we didn't have the testing capacity at the start of the pandemic, it wasn't possible. Uh, uh, and what I am very proud of is that we built that testing capacity. But it took time, right? And it took me setting this uh, target, which people didn't think I was going to meet. And because of the team effort, we did meet that target. And then we had the testing available to be able to put the policy in place. Um, and um, I think you know that's that's how that's how you get things done. And that's how we're still getting things done. For instance, uh, now the big big drive is on making sure that we get the vaccine rollout done. And there, our goal is to make sure it's offered to all uh, adults by the end of July. And we're on track for that target, too. Next question, Pippa Creer. Pippa. Health Secretary, we've spoken to families today who lost their lo loved ones to COVID last spring after patients were discharged back into their care homes without being tested. One said she cried when she heard Dominic Cummings' testimony. And she said, I will not be I've been the only one crying because it reminds you of the disaster particularly when he was talking about not having a plan for care homes. Another who lost her mum told us, nothing he said surprised me at all. It just showed the general chaos and lack of information in government. I feel that my mum is one of the tens of thousands of people who didn't need to die. And a third lost his dad, and he said it was absolute chaos. He didn't know what they were doing. As we all know, the buck stops with our prime minister. He's got ultimate responsibility. But I do hold Matt Hancock responsible as well. There have been 36,275 deaths involving COVID in UK care homes since the pandemic began. You promised to put a protective ring around them, but you didn't. And yet today, you dodged questions from the media, from MPs about some of the specifics, and now you're doing it from the media. Why, when there clearly wasn't sufficient, sufficient testing capacity to do it safely, did you sign off the discharge plan? Can you give families the answers and finally give them the peace that they deserve? Well, thank you, Pippa. Um, I've been answering questions all morning and all afternoon, and it's very, very important to. In fact, that's been our whole approach throughout this pandemic, has been to uh, answer questions uh, from the public and from the media and, of course, from MPs. And many, many people have lost loved ones. Uh, as you know, you know that includes my family. Um, and the truth in, the, in this a situation is that because we didn't have the testing capacity it wasn't possible until we built that capacity to put 
the testing in place. And we were dealing with an unprecedented situation, as you know. And that is one of the things that, um, that I will always look back on, uh, which is that we worked incredibly hard to put in place what is needed to uh, fight a pandemic. And thankfully now, um, over the last few months, we've really got these, these things in place, the, the over a million tests a day on a regular basis, and of course, uh, the vaccine, which we've been working on since the start. So, of course, my heart goes out to all those who've lost loved ones. But all I can say is that we worked to do everything we possibly could in what were uh, difficult circumstances. Uh, on the details of the, of the policy uh, and why it was in place, and crucially, what we've learned, is including, for instance, on the, uh, the asymptomatic transmission of the, of the virus, the fact it passes on people who don't have any symptoms. You know, we have developed and improved our policy towards uh, care homes as the testing capacity uh, has grown. And maybe on the clinical side, uh, Dr. Harris will be able to, uh, to address those parts of the question. Um, yes, thank you, Secretary of State. I, I think, um, I mean, obviously for, for any, uh, I think, you know, my family as well uh, uh, has, has lost somebody at the start of the pandemic. So I think we, we do feel for those families. If I just go back to uh, the evidence, and this is going to sound quite clinical and, and scientific, but that's what I've been asked to do. Actually, uh, one of the reasons that the uh, subgroup, the SAGE subgroup was set up was uh, to really try and look at what were the reasons for these very significant rates of infection uh, and death in uh, residential care settings. And it was set up in a way to be able to feed back directly uh, to the adult social care policy plan in order to be able to implement findings as quickly as possible. And if you look at the death rates, um, and bear in mind the, the evidence we found from the fact that the discharge from hospitals was actually a very, very tiny uh, proportional cause of cases. Uh, what has had a huge impact is the testing of, a regular testing of staff and residents. Now, actually, for staff who do this on a regular basis, it's, it's quite time consuming for them. So a huge thank you to them because every week they do a PCR test and they do two lateral flow device tests. And if you look at the second wave, what you can see is that allows this regular testing means not only do we know if somebody comes in and has a positive test before they start work, uh, they don't come into, care, into the, the setting. Uh, so they are not, no risk of passing on that infection to others. Uh, and equally, of course, we've had vaccination programs. But the, the lateral flow testing has been a really important Important part of just keeping an eye on that. The PCR testing allows us to run at the same time, is more sensitive, so we're doing it doubly and checking to see about variant access. Um, and, and we can get on top of these things much more quickly now. Thanks very much. Uh, next question is from Steve Swinford at The Times. Steve. wasn't sufficient testing capacity. Why, when there clearly wasn't sufficient testing capacity, did you sign off the discharge plan? Um, I, I'm terribly sorry, I'm not sure that I got the full question, but I think what you're saying is um, that since the challenge was the testing capacity, um, why did you have the plan? Well, uh, firstly, we took clinical advice on what the appropriate thing to do was. That was the best way to proceed in these circumstances. But critically, you got to build the testing capacity, and that's what we did. Um, and, um, and, and we published these, uh, all these plans at the time and discussed it. Uh, in fact, we discussed it at press conferences uh, at the time. Uh, what is the, the, the best way to approach it? And that's something on which uh, we took the clinical advice. Thanks. Um, Steve Swinford at the Times. Uh, Mr. Hancock, have you spoken to the Prime Minister about the evidence given by Dominic Cummings yesterday in which he accused you of being a serial liar? And has Boris Johnson personally given you his reassurance that he has confidence in you as his health secretary. Um, and Dr. Harris, on the, on the roadmap, Professor Neil Ferguson said this morning that the easing of lockdown restrictions on the 21st of June is very much in the balance, given the rate at which the Indian variant is spreading. Do you agree with him on that? Well, the Prime Minister and I talk all the time, and uh, we're working incredibly hard on getting this vaccine rollout as broad as possible, making sure people get their second doses, and obviously very vigilant to the, in particular to the areas of the country where cases are uh, starting to rise as I've set out. So that is 
Uh, that's, that's what we focus on because that is what really matters to getting this country out of this pandemic. I mean, you know, this isn't over yet. Uh, and the, in a way, the rise in case rates in the last couple of days demonstrate that we've all got to be vigilant and we've still all of us got to take personal responsibility for what we can do to help keep this under control as we get the vaccine rolled out. It is a race between the two and that's what we're focused on. Um, Jenny? Yeah, so on the, the roadmap, I absolutely agree with, uh, with Professor Neil Ferguson. The, the roadmap works on, on four principles to, to go forward. So it's on, uh, on the cases, uh, hospitalizations, uh, the effectiveness of the vaccine program, and then new variants. And so in many ways, we're looking at the first part and the last part. Um, and if you just look at the pure data, which is out today, uh, it looks quite worrying. So we had 3,535 cases of the, uh, of the um, 617 uh, point two uh, last week, and we have uh, uh, just about double that, 6,959 now. However, uh, what is important, when I mentioned when I was doing the slides, is we are actively going out and finding cases, so we do expect cases to rise. We also expected some cases to, uh, to rise as we gradually start to socialise. Um, and uh, I think what's important is when you look at where these patterns of cases are, if, for example, you look at London data recently, where there's been a huge effort uh, in, in all of these areas, actually, but in surge testing and the faster speed that we can detect uh, new variants using uh, different techniques and genomic testing, um, in some areas, they have closed down. So we haven't seen, uh, we've seen a bit of community transmission and then it's closed down again. Now, the biggest area probably is, is Northwest, as we know, and I know uh, the uh, Bolton team are working really hard and also in the Greater Manchester area to try and maintain these numbers quite uh, low. So I think it is really, really just on the cusp at the moment. Uh, if we see cases rise, we're not clear yet uh, quite whether that is a rise in the variant cases um, or uh, taking off or whether it's actually a, a rise because we are actively, quite rightly, detecting them and then challenging these chains of transmission. So really important thing. On, on the good news, of course, we are not seeing that generally translating into uh, increased cases of hospitalisation and definitely not into deaths. Um, and, and so obviously the, the key message is there, key, even if we can just hold it while the vaccination programme gets rolled out, uh, we stand a much better chance of getting through this, uh, this uh, session. So my, my simple message, which is where I started, is please go and get your jab, and particularly if you've got a second jab due shortly. Thanks very much. I mean, that last point is the absolutely critical one for the country, which is we are in a race between the virus and this vaccine. The vaccine is effective, so we've got to get the vaccine out as quickly as possible. And that is the thing that really, really matters. Uh, final question is from Jen Williams from the Manchester Evening News. Jen. Thanks. Uh, a question to the Health Secretary, if that's OK. Um, Manchester and Trafford's health and social care system started testing all care home residents before discharge in the middle of March 2020 because they knew then that there was a risk and so they found a way to do it. So why did it not become national policy for another month? And do you wish you'd taken more advice from local public health and social care leaders at the start of the pandemic? Uh, and one for Dr Harris. There's obviously been a lot of national attention on Bolton in the last few weeks, and uh, there are signs that infection rate rises that are now slowing thanks to the measures that have been taken. Um, but those in most other Greater Manchester boroughs are now rising very fast. Should these places now be getting similar military surge vaccination support to Bolton? Thanks. Uh, thanks very much. The, you know, the, uh, come back to the earlier point. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have the testing capacity to put that policy in place across the whole country. You know, uh, I, it would have been wonderful if we'd started this pandemic with a very large testing capacity. We didn't. We had to build one. And that, then once we'd built one, we were able to put that policy in place uh, nationwide. Um, when it comes to Bolton, there are some early signs that the increase in rates may be starting to cap out. We did see this, this programme of surge testing plus uh, surge vaccinations work in South London and I'm, uh, but I'm, but I'm really, really watching the, the Bolton rates uh, very closely. Um, uh, Dr. Harris. Thank you. Um, 
Yes, so I'm, I might just do a call out here for, for the Director of Public Health in Bolton, Helen Towie, who has been absolutely brilliant in supporting this, and we work very closely with her. Um, I think, the, as Secretary of State said, the cases actually do look as though they are starting to plateau out, um, but uh, the spillover in community transmission in local areas is an important one. What we are finding in a lot of places, though, that it's not actually what we would call generalised transmission, that you can still see focal points of outbreaks, whether it be uh, a community centre, whether it be a school or a, or a faith building. Um, and so uh, it's really important that that local understanding is brought into the picture so that we can surge the testing and put in support in those areas. Um, I, I think, actually, uh, the way that Test and Trace are now working, swivelling around that services and building from the local system, is a really important one um, and we're doing that generally right across areas looking out for other parts of Greater Manchester to see how we can uh, support them but uh, the data at the moment is uh, and those uh, those uh, support uh, enablers for for local people are very much focused on the areas where we can see the rate of change the rate of growth uh, in transmission is the greatest uh, but we'll continue to watch that obviously thanks very much I mean if I can I just add one other thing Jen which is that you know People in Bolton have really stepped up, and I'm very, very grateful. Um, and you can see it in the queues of people uh, getting vaccinated, the big increase in numbers of vaccinations, the big increase in testing and people coming forward to get tested. Uh, I think the council have done a brilliant job, and their leader, David Greenall, is doing a great job, as well as the director of public health. Um, and we, are, we will keep supporting Bolton, and we are also watching very carefully uh, other areas uh, because if this package of support works effectively against this variant in Bolton, then it's a model for how we can tackle it without having to resort to a local lockdown, which obviously nobody wants to see. So that it's um, uh, uh, so far so good, but stick at it, Bolton, we'll get there. And that ends this Downing Street press conference. Thanks very much. <laughs>